lot of people who may want to get involved in investing. Maybe they've heard of Bitcoin, etc. So we were just going through the basics and explaining uh, uh, what 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 that's about. But Mark, I'm very happy to have you here with us. Thank you for spending your time out of your busy schedule. How are you this evening? I'm doing well, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for having me on board to have a really interesting conversation about you know, all the stuff that you're interested in around technology, education, and so on. Fantastic. Yeah, I appreciate you joining us, I really do. Um, so yeah, let, let's get straight into it. I, I did a, a, a slight bit of a preamble in terms of yourself. Um, if people have read the advert, they would have seen some of the things that you've done. But if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do for those people who may not know you. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I've been teaching for the last 15 years in education. And when I first got into education at the time, um, technology was this thing where everyone was talking about it. And most people didn't know that how it's actually going to transform our communities and local spaces. But as someone who was always interested in networking and computing, and after I'd done my degree, I was working in a school. And the school commented me and, and gave me a lot of encouragement to say, hey, you know, what you do in a classroom is great. Why don't you become a teacher? Because I was a mentor in the school at the time. So cut a long story short, I am here now, 15 years deep into teaching. And um, yeah, I've been able to become a thought leader, been able to travel to different countries. And also I've been able to kind of share my passion for education. How do we really change um, what's happening in the classroom? How do we make it to the 21st century? But also, how do we think about the future? How can we make this the best education system in the world? And some of the things that I've done in the last couple of years has kind of pushed towards that, that probably we might talk more on in this interview. Right, okay. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that, that's great stuff, the fact that you've been able to have that journey. Um, from humble teacher to you know event speaker um and as we said you 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 have a mbe from the queen you know recognition of the work that you've been doing in, in the ed education technology space um these are amazing things and really i think you know a question i think will be pertinent is how on earth do you do you start how how do you go from just being a teacher. Yes, you, you explained that you had a passion for technology, but how do you go from a teacher to doing what you're doing now? We, we call it a teacherpreneur, right? So someone who's entrepreneurial and they bring that into the, uh, their, their teaching field that they're doing. So how did you essentially become a teacherpreneur? So one of the things that you'll find when you're really passionate about something is you normally find gaps. And gaps are an indicator to you as a professional. So I saw there was a gap in education between what I was teaching my curriculum and what the industry needed. And I wanted to test this gap because, you know, sometimes we might have a great idea or we might have a great drive to do something, but it's not really needed. We're like, we're like we're trying to solve problems that don't really need to be solved. So I started to go to the industry events, a lot of industry events, and they were talking about, yes, we need to get young people ready. We need to be thinking about digital skills. We need to be thinking about the curriculum. We need to be thinking about all of these things um, that we feel that teachers are not thinking about. And what was interesting is, is that I'd been the only teacher in the room and being this enthusiast to understand this space and understand the gap in my passion I started to see a platform starting to emerge because being the only teacher in the room alongside all of these industry leaders and professionals, it was inevitable. They were saying, well, Mark, let's hear your voice. What do you think about this? And that gave me a great platform then to kind of share my insights in terms of how do you really bridge the gap? What are the opportunities out there for um, young people? And then off the back of that, then that gave me the platform to start speaking at different events and different shows because after you build a rep uh, reputation up of speaking on the, on the circuit, then before you know it, you know, you're getting calls from different countries to that and traveling to share your passion there or to share your insights or your intellectualism and so on. Interesting. 
it, it all seemed pretty straightforward until you said, before you know it, you get calls to speak around the world. Now, surely there's a bit more uh, detail in there in terms of how that happened. So you, you spoke at events. Mm -hmm. uh, people appreciate what you were saying. So I guess then it depends on who was in the audience, right? To hear, those, to hear what you were saying. Is that how it works? Um, so to become a global speaker or to, um, to really drive your passion or to drive your insights or to, uh, to, to drive your professionalism, you need to hold in on something. And sometimes it's one of these things where whoever shouts loudest gets hurt. And I was shouting from my corner of the world that, listen, there's this big gap emerging in education and what's happening on my high street and in the local communities. Everything's becoming automated. The communities can't keep up with it. Schools can't keep up with it. Local um, government can't keep up with it. And then I started to give them a lot, of, a lot of bridges in the sense of all these gaps. I started to throw a lot of bridges around to a lot of these people that were policymakers at the time and people in education. And the, 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 the problem there was is that sometimes in these spaces, people are talking about utopia and the promised land. What worked for me so well and was able to get me to a new space and a new place, so to say, is actually just showing small proof points of actually where it works. So by bringing all these professionals that were set, who were panicking about the future into my school to talk to my young people and to do projects, case studies and initiatives, that then helped me. So when I did go and speak at different shows and different uh, events, I had a lot of evidence. I had a lot of proof points. And sometimes when you go to a lot of events, people are talking from, you know, they're, they're talking from a hypothetical uh, stance. And I was talking from a practical um, stance. So that was able to give me a lot of credibility within this space. Then based off of the credibility, that's when, you know, um, if you're sharing your stuff online, it's not just <laughs> to your local community. It's a global platform. And when you start religiously sharing the stuff online that you've been talking about, you've got all these practical proof points inevitably someone's going to tap in and say, hey, can you come to this country? Or, you know, can we, you know, jump online at 12 a.m. at night and, and talk about your passions? And that's what I started to do. So most of, it's funny, most of my, um, my speaking was online to U.S. Um, teachers and educators and so on. Right, okay. So that, that's very insightful because I think, um, especially the, the point that you made about um, bringing some of those companies into your school and actually having the, 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 the experience to bring back to people and say, actually, this works or this doesn't work. Um, how did that come about? How did you manage to get companies to come in? It's a challenge. So I normally challenge people. So when I was on, um, going to visit to um, these different events, um, what I would normally do is um, challenge people's kind of, um, hypothesis that you know we're not linking up well with um, um, schools effectively and I will tell them we'll come in and show us what you got so I had a few funny stories where a couple of these ed techs would boast that they got the best products in the world and what I would do intentionally set them up with the most rowdiest kids in the school so off the back of that the students would rip those products apart and you know a lot of morales got uh, beaten up and battered and bruised but for me <laughs> Those little proof points there, I was able to show to a wider ed tech sector, like, listen, if you're going to make these products, you've got to make sure that you've got all stakeholders around the table, including my students. So in terms of inviting professionals into your school, again, it's about where, where is that gap? Where is the gap that you're trying to solve or what you're trying? If you're just inviting people in for the sake of inviting people in, you're not going to have the impact. You're not going to have the um, pull. But if you've got, if you've got, if you're passionate about something and you're seeing that there's a problem that needs to be addressed, bring those experts in to try and fill that problem or what you're trying to address. So whether it's the fact that as a professional, you might not have certain expertise, but you know that in other sectors, they've got that expertise. So why aren't we collaborating or cross-pollinating with those um, professionals? And that's what I've done lots and lots. So it got to a point where I think I've invited over that. In, in one school, I invited over about 15 tech companies in one year. It got, it got so bad that the young people like, sir, we can actually set up our own companies now because we've actually clocked it after your 15th one. And most of them were trying to build apps. Some of them were going home and trying to build games. Some of them were trying to make their own blog post because they knew 
that with all these experts, that they could also be an expert too. Right, right, right. Wow. There's so much in that. Um, I think, you know, it it sounds like you must have been very busy because obviously you're a teacher and you still have the curriculum to deliver. Uh, On top of delivering the curriculum, you've got people coming in. Uh, First of all, how was that received by the schools that you were working in? Was that received with open arms or was that, uh, hold on, you're kind of going a bit off script here. How, How was that received as you were doing it? I always told people that when, you, when you're bringing about system change, do not just let the change naturally happen. Sometimes you've got to engineer that change or set up the play that when the play happens, you haven't got giraffes, elephants, and all the other animals involved. You've just got the set characters and you've got a few um, things involved. So in terms of trying to get the different stakeholders or the buy-ins, you've got to show them that, hey, there's this great opportunity here to, you know, connect our young people to industry experts. Are we going to miss on this opportunity and give this opportunity to a school down the road? And then once you present it like that, what you find is that a lot of the leaders of the school saw the benefit of our young people interacting with experts. Now, when you do one or two, you use them as proof points to build up on the three and four and the five and six. So every expert that you come in and, and does something with, young people, then you got more ammunition to shout about in your school to say like, listen, did you know who came in last week with our young people and done this amazing workshop? And look at the impact of our young people. It's boost their confidence. Now, um, how can we invite other people into to build upon that? So if you don't, if you just, as I said, goes back to my original point. If you just invite people into a school, into your organization, just for the sake of it, just to tick a box, you're not going to get the impact or the kind of traction you want to see. So it's all about trying to find that purpose that you have that's burning, the gap. I always talk about the gap. And then also thinking about how is that story? What's the story that you want to tell as a professional, as a thought leader, as a visionary, as a futurist, to actually propel you to have that allow the voice within that space? Okay. Wow. That's fantastic. I think... Um, there are a number of people that may be watching this that are thinking to themselves, okay, um, this is all great stuff. This is good. Um, but how do I apply this outside of education? And I know you've got a very deep network. Um, and in terms of uh, networking, you're a huge advocate of building bridges and having vital networks between uh, different sectors even. Um, so for people who are maybe not in education, they're thinking, right, there are expertise in this area here. I really need to build a bridge between myself because that's essentially what you did, isn't it? So I don't know if you could talk us through how you went about approach because you've approached like Al Jazeera. You've, you, you've had, you know, major companies come into your school and your students have literally picked apart their products so how does uh, someone go about um maybe uh starting to build a network like that or uh, talk us through one of those conversations how does that go mark martin he's thinking right i want to work with this company here talk us through what you do next okay so um natwest bank contacted me because they wanted to work with us to to bring about some real system change I didn't say agent of change. Agent of change is like an individual trying to change the system within. I'm talking about the whole system change. How do we bring about a real kind of transformation? And at the time, um, no one in the school saw this vision that I had in the sense that if we mean this network's banking to work with our young people, can we co-create an apprenticeship? Because at the moment, apprenticeships are getting bad reps because everyone's got this whole whole kind of uh, preconceived idea that it's about young people going in and working, um, you know, at a minimal cheap labor or making a cup of teas and so forth. And actually a lot of apprenticeships now are doing a good job, but I saw that, you know, with this whole bad rep about apprenticeships and, you know, how much of our young people in local areas, such as Southeast London, where it's really diverse, how do we get our young people involved in these spaces? So instead of just sending our students to go and apply for an apprenticeship at the bank, I told the bank, oh, actually, let's co-create an apprenticeship together with my young people. 
Mm. And for two sessions, the young people created the, the apprenticeship and um, they then got the opportunity to meet with the directors of the company, of the innovation hub in that West, down in Liverpool Street. And off the back of that, um, 10 people from around the UK got selected for the apprenticeship and now they're actively live and direct um, following out this apprenticeship. Wow. Now that was, that was kind of a groundbreaking in the sense that we got these unique stakeholders together. I even got my young people into the boardroom. Sometimes even um, staff in organisations can't sit in the boardroom with all these directors and stakeholders of an organisation. But I was able to get my young people in there. And what happened when my young people were in there they were dropping some game on some of the directors and a lot of them were like really stunned by the, um, by the level of intellect that our young people had and, and insight they had around technology. And again, a lot of perceptions were changed. Um, they were offering us, jo- they were offering some of my young people jobs and freelancing jobs yeah. and my young people were getting really inspired by it. But I said, okay, that's one thing because we know that you know, young people are talented. We know talent's everywhere, but it's just about the access and opportunities. So when um, a couple of months later, I said, you know what, what else can we do now? So a lot of our young people lack soft skills. So they're too busy on the mobile phone sometimes that they lack the eye contact. They lack, they lack the communication skills. They lack everything. Why don't we get some young people to go onto the shop floor of a bank where you have to have A1 um, soft skills on, on, on lock right. to really deal with customers. And as we speak in now, I've got, I've got five, no, four young people in that West Bank as we're speaking for Monday to Friday this week doing work experience, developing that, that soft skill. So, well, as that's I said before, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I think yeah. sometimes we might underestimate the importance of that. The fact is, actual communication, the ability to actually socialize is lacking in young people these days so um that that's amazing yeah sorry go ahead so the important thing here is just that you can see that if i didn't have that kind of big macro thinking because don't get me wrong there's two types of there's two actually there's three spaces that people normally sit in i'd be sitting in a micro department where you're looking at the really small things of the organization or institution or wherever you're working and then you've got a macro where people are looking at the big vision and so forth. Now, obviously in schools, we're, we're, to be honest, we're focused on the, the micro stuff, like the exam results, coursework, delivering the content and so forth. And then we really think about the macro, like where's our young people going to end up when they leave us? What jobs are they going to be accessing? What's going to happen to them in our local communities? And all I've done is sat in the middle of that, the micro and the macro. And that's what they normally call meso level. So I was just playing that meso level because just like the example I gave around that West Bank, so that there was an issue around apprenticeships and around young people's soft skills. I have sat in that meso level because I know that those skills or those um, little initiatives or projects will feed into both. You'll feed into the uh, micro because those students will come back and have a bit more sense of um, maturity. And then when they leave us, they've got a nice reference to say that I worked in a bank. And that that can probably help me in the future. And those little things there, that's where I can then take, whether it's the government or whether it's to the top tech industry and say, what are you guys doing then? How are you guys changing the game? Because I've just done this on one person myself. What if you can inspire another million teachers to do what I'm doing around thinking about how can they sit in the meso level in education? Right, right. That's that's excellent. Um... Just to backtrack a little bit, so you were contacted by NetWest Bank. So how does someone go about actually contacting a company? So I don't know um, if there's anyone that sticks out to you in terms of, oh, maybe in the early days when you hadn't Man, done it. Listen, I, I was, I was tri- like, to be honest with you, most of my contacts have been made through social media. And I've... Like I formed um, another organization called UK Black Tech and that was formed from 11 tech professionals around the UK doing amazing stuff in technology because UK Black Tech, we knew that there was, a, there was this kind of um, underrepresentation, especially with um, 
you know, minorities within the tech sector, are they visible? So no like music, you can see, you can just go on YouTube and see lots of musicians and so forth. But if you want to see tech professionals or STEM professionals, where do you go to see that unless you want to go to like a kind of science fair or go online and look at the one clip? I actually felt that there needed to be a platform to actually showcase innovation coming from minority backgrounds. Because ultimately, that if we, if we do it right, that would change a, a wider perception of how we're viewed in these spaces. So one of the things that I found to, to answer the question is around reaching out to people on LinkedIn, reaching out to people on Twitter, and going to events. If you're not in those spaces, engaging with those people, building relationships, then it's very hard to cold call them and ask them to come and do something for you or to work together and so forth. So it's about building those relationships where it's offline or online and making sure that you're genuine with your approach. You're not just kind of just using people for the sake of just name, brand, sake. Actually, you see there's a, a value in them and they can see a value in what you're trying to do and then make it happen. Fantastic. That's really good. So it's just good old fashioned networking, isn't it? Good old fashioned networking. Yeah, in that space. And just reaching out to people, watch their work, study them. So it's funny, one of the one of the things I didn't share is that you might also say, Mark, so how come, you know, you know, you got a massive following online? So when I first joined social media and started to share my practice, that was all stemmed from watching other people do their stuff. So I, I made a list on, on, on these social media platforms. You know you can make a list and only see the top people in that list if you decide to have a list of top people. Mm. And if you study what they're trying to do and then you're studying what you're trying to do, then you benchmark yourself of quality. So that's what I've done for the first probably two years of social media. Mm. I thought the best in my, uh, in my kind of computer science and tech space. And they said, you know what? there's a lot of good practices that I can now use in my um, life and in my work to, uh, to, you know, to make a bigger impact. Fantastic. That's really good. Um, practical as well. Um, what, what, what I want to know, and I think this is kind of the, the get into the title and the essence of this interview is how on earth do you have time for all of this? <laughs> so, you know, you're working, uh, but then essentially you're coming home from work and you're doing more work, right? Um, there are a lot of people who find it difficult to juggle that. They don't really have uh, the discipline. What practical tips can you give to those people? Because I, I, I see your social media. You know, I know you work during the daytime. In the evening, you're in this event over here. And then the next day, you're at a university up in, in the middle of the country. And then the next day, you're receiving an award here. So you obviously have to really manage your time wisely um so yeah if you have any practical tips you would be grateful to hear them man you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it or not time management is not the greatest asset of mine but one thing i i would say that's been my secret success is stay in your lane, <laughs> stay right. in your lane. so that means that if you're if you're pursuing this kind of thing in education just stay in education and double down and you know lowest hanging fruit so let me unpack that a little bit Doubling down means that whatever you're good at, keep on improving what you're good at because, you know, it makes traveling across the UK or traveling to another country or um, working on a really exciting projects because you know you're good at it and that's where your talent lies. And, you know, you go where the opportunities exist. So you double down on your lowest hanging fruit because you go where the opportunity exists. And for me, in terms of managing my time, I manage it because all of the stuff that I'm doing, I'm comfortable in that space. I'm comfortable in terms of bringing my expertise and my insights and my knowledge. And that means that I've got less. If, if I wasn't that, I would be spending more time at home planning, organizing, trying to figure things out. But I don't need to figure things out because I'm living and breathing that lane that I'm living in. Now, if I decide to one day say, do you know what, I've had enough of um, education and technology and so forth, I'm going to go into more of a kind of rural, green life, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be the best grass cutter. That's going to be in my mind. I'm going to know how to, you know, cut the grass at a certain percentage, centimetres, when does it grow, when does it die, all of these kind of things I want to get into. And then when it comes to that bigger time of, you know, showing the, 
taking the, my lawn to the moon, people will see that progress and transition because I've stayed in that lane all along. Fantastic. That's no, metaphors mean. and analogies there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think we know what you mean in terms of that. I think um, I'm definitely not one to talk when it comes to staying in my lane. I do so many different things, <laughs> but I That's know that... Saying. This is where it gets confusing because it's one of these old kind. it's like a biblical term in like wherever you, wherever you put your time is that's where your master is and you can't be in two places at one time and i know that you know we live in a digital age where there's so much things that i could be doing i could be programming i could be um code i could be building websites i could be building mobile apps i could be doing blockchain i could be doing crypto i could be i could be doing so much different things and there's not enough time in the day to do that so my kind of advice is that yes yeah, just Home in on the thing that works for you. And if it, if it incorporates a little bit of, you know, machine or blockchain and a bit of trading and all of these kind of stuff, then let it work in that lane. But when you're trying to go into other lanes and so forth, that's when time and family commitments and all the other commitments seem like, where on earth do I get the time to do this? Yes, indeed. And as I'm living that, I, I know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> but um, I think you've explained a little bit about how to build a network. So I'm not going to ask you about building a network. Um, what I do want you to do, though, is explain how uh, you, uh, the, the process of the MBE, you were acknowledged uh, by the Queen. Um, I, you said hi from me, by the way. Uh, tell she still owes me some money. Uh, but um, yeah, talk to us on a serious note. Tell, what was that experience like for you, uh, receiving an MBE? So when I first got the letter, I thought it was the police. I thought there was some type of thing that I've done in my past <laughs> to haunt me. And, you know, um, I, it just shot, it took me out of the blue because normally when you apply for an MBE, in some cases, you you know you're being nominated or you get, you're, 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 you're trying to get people around you to nominate you for um, the actual award. But in this uh, occasion, um, I was just unaware of it all. And it was just a pleasant surprise when I received it. Obviously, it was mixed, remote, uh, mixed emotions because, you know, I've got family that came from the Rimrush generation that came in the 1960s and 70s to really think about um, coming to a better uh come to a country to make some real uh, change and you know the way they've been treated in the last couple of years and that was biting at the back of me should I accept this or not but what was really interesting about this MBE is about the community that I'm in and the young people that I'm actually working with and um, a lot of them have said they didn't even know what MBE is or you know to even be um, recognized for an award and I felt that it would have been it would have been a great um, advantage for me to have this award so that the community can see that, hey, someone can be recognised for their skills. So normally when you get these awards, it's sometimes you be like a bit dodgy in the sense of why you're getting the award. But I've stuck in my lane education, I've stuck in my lane technology, um, I've done really well in that field and I've been recognised for it at a very high level. And I really wanted to um, take the award on that basis that, yeah, you've been recognised for the skills that you've been doing and so forth. So, you know, MBEs, would I recommend it? Yes, if I think we, we, need to, we need to see more people being acknowledged um, for skills and for their talents and so forth. And I, I would always encourage that, you know, if they're, if they're handing that, if you, if you worked really hard for that over your lifetime, um, I would say to take it. But, um, yeah, some people are, convicted um, from the empire days and, and the legacy of that. And I get that if you, didn't, if you don't want to accept it. But um, in terms of working with young people and community, um, you know, I'm at the right, I'm at the centerpiece of it. That's fantastic. That's really good. Uh, and congratulations again. Um, one, uh, maybe a couple more questions. Um, what do you feel is the uh, most valuable skill uh, that you've learned over the years? What has been the, uh, the, the thing that you've learned that has maybe propelled you forward the most? Man, the most important skill I've learned is emotional intelligence. My goodness. You, that skill there can take you to some very, very interesting places because 
people don't really talk about this a lot. And I didn't really get this when I was doing my teacher training all those years back. How do you desensitize your feelings and emotions to do with the emotions and feelings in front of you? And sometimes, you know, as humans, we're very emotive people where we bounce off different emotions. So if someone's offended you, you're not going to have it. You're going to try and fight back or you're going to kind of defend your position. And when I was working, because it's, it's funny, because my, my teaching career hasn't been the, um, the, the most roses in the sense that it's been plain sailors. Lots of challenges. And sometimes we don't really talk about our challenges. Mm. And I couldn't understand when I came to education, the lack of respect young people had for their elders. And, you know, when I was growing up, you know, having respect for your elders was just like the number one rule. Uh, don't get me started. Don't yeah. Me, don't get me. <laughs> and what was interesting is, is that when you go into, um, in, when I was working in like some really tough schools at the time, there was very little respect that young people would give. And I didn't understand why. I just felt that by default, you should just respect your oldest, period. But once you understand emotional intelligence, you, you start to see things in a different light. Where some of these young people that are probably giving you the most attitude or the most, um, you know, um, just showing re really kind of um, negative behavior, is because there's something behind it. There's a root to the problem. There's something that I'm not seeing. And I'm just getting angry because I'm dealing with the emotions in front of me. But actually, I haven't taken a kind of a macro view of that young person. So what I would normally do now is when I ever approach a situation, I try and look at it from a bird's eye view. So when I go into a brand new business adventure or when I'm thinking about my curriculum or teaching or education and technology, I try and think of it from a bird's eye view before a face on view. Because face on view sometimes is, is you know, you, you don't know what it is. But when you look, for, look at it from the 50,000 feet, then you can see like the whole kind of layout of what you're dealing with. So the skill of emotional intelligence, now, if I do see young people showing that disrespect, I can actually take 10 steps back and tell us a young person, sit think, okay, and, you know, do you need to get some support or help around the issue that you're struggling with? And that then I can then use into my professional stuff with technology and in the business world because, you know, a lot of people are opinionated on how the future should um, go and what should organizations be doing to be scaling up and to be making all of this money and so forth and i've just used the same technique emotion intelligence sometimes you take that five steps back see it from the macro view see where you can be the most valuable or or the most um, effective in those spaces and also saying no or walking away from the opportunity if it doesn't align because sometimes if you see it face to face you might think wow this is really lucrative it's going to sort me out for the next couple of years but actually if you look at it from a bird's eye view how much time and bandwidth and energy you're going to burn out in the process of doing that so yeah I, I think that the biggest skill is emotional intelligence but you might ask what's the skill of the future that might be another question so the skill of the future for me is conflict resolution how do you diffuse a conflict uh, I think that one of the biggest things that we don't do in society and in education and also in our communities is teach people how to uh you know de-escalate conflict or diffuse conflict or to just think about how you de um escalate in 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 in, in, a, in a very hot heated situation i think that's going to be the skill of the future not digital skills okay okay have you ever been in those situations where where it seems to be getting very hot in the room yeah, many times. Listen, as I said, when you're working in education and technology and you're, and you're sitting in boardrooms and everyone's opinionated and everyone's got a certain view on how things should be going, sometimes you just got to think about the bigger picture in the sense that is it, is it worth me um, indulging in these types of conversations? Because, you know, over the years, you learn a, you learn a few secret rules. Peace is better than war. If you see two people arguing, you don't know who's the fool. So those are kind of the things that I kind of have at the back of my mind in the sense that, you know, can this situation 
be um, resolved if I walk away from it and say no. Because there is a power in saying no in, 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 professional, in the professional world. I think sometimes you say yes to everything. And then when you're kind of uh, deep in the deep end, um, you'll cry for help. But that could have been easy avoided if you just said, no, this is not the way I want to go or this is not my lane. Sure, sure. That's really good. That's really good. I think um, we're going to uh, bring the uh, interview to a close. I'm going to ask you for any final pearls of wisdom that you want to leave with people. Uh, but just in terms of the main takeaways from what we've discussed here, I think really you're saying network, really uh, just get involved in the basics of networking, go to the right places, talk to people. Um, you're talking about perspective as well. You spoke a lot about seeing things from a, a broader view, both with people and with companies. And you also were encouraging people to stay in their lane, hold, double down on what you're good at. And um, also there was something else you mentioned about excellence. You studied the people who were doing well and you aimed for that. That was your standard. So I think they're very key takeaways from, from uh, this interview today. So I really appreciate that, Mark. Um, but yeah, any final thoughts? Any, what are the uh, Martin pearls of wisdom that you're going to drop? Because I, I, again, on your uh, Twitter feed, you, you have these, uh, I say this to my student every day, uh, posts where you will uh, have these little pearls of wisdom. So what do you want to uh, leave with uh, the viewers today? So one of the things is that we're seeing, and, and let's look at um, technology. Here's my pearls of wisdom for, you know, what's happening with technology. So we're seeing our whole high streets and communities become automated. You know, back in the day, you tell a young person to get a job in the, in the, in the supermarket. But if you go into the supermarket, there's self-service checkouts now. You can even walk around with these little mobile devices that the supermarket gives you so you can check the prices. You don't even have to ask no one in the supermarket to, to kind of purchase or to, to, to buy items. And now you've got um, this robotic machine. And then when you go into some of the fast food um, retailers, you've got touch screens, so you don't have to talk to no one. You can just touch, swipe, get the, get the items. And then when you go to transport systems, again, you just touch, off you go. And... We're seeing more and more on a daily basis our whole community become automated. And one of the things that came out on Friday is about facial recognition in the sense of, um, you know, what, what's happening with facial recognition. That's, that's then now changing a lot of how kind of um, CCTV operates because um, I don't know, my, 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 actually my degree was on um, CCTV. And um, actually, I was saying my master's on CCTV. Does CCTV change the behavior of students if CCTV is uh, focused on them? And one of the things I want to leave people with is around this question around who controls um, this information? How long is the information going to be controlled? And then if we're not in these spaces of innovation and creativity, what the future is going to look like? And One of the things for me is that, yes, we want to, um, yes, we want to navigate these spaces that we operate in, but also we need to ask, we need to start asking these challenging questions around where is the future going with this technology? How much is it going to be changing our life? And yes, I do tell my students every day that when you do hear stuff about technology and transformation, make sure you check free sources. Check free sources before you validate um, the answer. So for all my, uh, for all these people that are logged on to, to this live session is that going forward and especially around your talent in your lane, make sure you've got free sources to actually confirm your hypothesis on things. Because if you haven't got those free sources, then one thing about um, computer science is that we don't teach computer science to learn coding or to be, um, to learn coding and programming or to be more tech savvy or to make money. Actually, we teach you computer science. So one day you don't get manipulated by the technology or the, you don't be coded. So if you don't learn to code, you'll be coded. Or if you don't understand the code, you'll be coded. So these are the things that we teach around in technology and education. It's not about, you know, just making you more smart and so forth. Actually, it's bringing you into a wider world of knowledge so you can understand the spaces around you. And the pearl of wisdom is, is that do you understand the space around you? 
do you understand what's happening in your local neighbourhoods and in your workplace and so forth from the macro view? But I could go on all night about this. <laughs> uh, and we would appreciate it if you did but I'll tell you what thank you we'll, we'll, we will draw it to a close there thank you so much Mark for your time appreciate you sharing your pearls of wisdom with us and um, thank you everybody who's watching uh, live and for those people who are watching on catch up um, join us next Tuesday for another live interview uh, for now again we say thank you to Mr. Mark Martin MBE uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time in the Honing Block Thank you, LC. Thank you for having me. No problem.